So now this is a thing called Too Late Blues, Ain't No Ambulances for No Niggas Tonight, which is uh, a poem from a forthcoming volume of poetry I have the same name, Ain't No Ambulances for No Niggas Tonight. And uh, this, historically, this has background to the Watts Festival, August 1968, and how the police came down on the black people. But it also has uh, some statements about a lot of fraudulent, very corny type uh, pseudo revolutionaries. So I get everybody in this, see? So I may have to leave after I finish this one, <laughs> if you can get to that. Okay, so here you go. The jitterbug bebops thought they was off in the boogie, but it was another dance altogether to the devil. So as Bo Dollar, Bo Pete, and the others grinded against their women, they fell perforated under the flames of baby, baby, baby. Horns as tall as corn stalks had sprung from the head of the beast. His tail made a tunnel through his striped pants and flapped through the vent of his frock coat. His fangs came forward and he French-tongued his dogs before coming down in lead rain on the rest of Dark Town. Monkey Jr. was ready when it went down, but couldn't get nobody to go with him. Sunday, the last day the sun shone across the livid face of white America, was when the torture took off. Came out of the blocks of gun barrels running fast. Didn't stop for nobody. Swept all the niggas and whites out of Will Rogers Park, hummed their sirens and came down too cold on the boulevard, 103rd Street, blowing people away. And they, the woolly-headed would-be lovers, would-be warriors, bit concrete under the fast-creeping bullets for goddamn sure out to kill every nigga they could. And they carried a victim, dripping red up the steps of the police station, asking only for an ambulance. But the beast manning the valiant watch station said, ain't no ambulances for no niggas tonight. No one went wild, they had been too busy getting high. They could not see the pink face of the oppressor sitting on the bull's eye of the black knight. Therefore, whatever guns the dumb and high had did, uh-uh, no good. Merely helped pave the way for tombstones. The devil ages were the days now that we were in, never too cool to kill a brother, but always dropping the gun when the beast with the badges arrived. And they shot little fats all of nine times after having made him get down on his knees and raise his arms in prayer. Forty million slabs were laid out. Fashion plate nationalists were too busy making money selling clothes to notice. They died in their bright African colors, Swahili curses dripping from their mouths. Many revolutionaries got theirs in the ass as they bucked atop another bourgeois bitch, preparing her for the revolution. Many who slipped in college and skated out with degrees were huff-puffing their way up the Mount Everest of the middle class when the tongue rope read up the honky's ass was cut and they landed on sabers. Ow! But it wasn't bebop. And Monkey Jr. found himself almost alone, but the nigga did get on his job. Straight out, mile, mile, Nat Turner madness. The red that passed for blood in the devil's veins laid out everywhere. He caught them in kitchens, grinning at the massacre over the radio. The housewives, the daughters, the babies, all their heads, yay, set up in their windows like pumpkins. Their bodies stuffed in their washing machines, piled in their bathtubs. And he masqueraded, white men stabbed in the belly by the shoeshine boy he pretended to be. Or spikes run through their mouths, nailing their heads to the floor by elevator boys with bloody gloves running up the alley. He dismembered babies and shitted on their bodies. Monkey Jr. was a wild madman, a black hurricane carrying knives and dancing through the white cities. He alone and no others was the only one to survive. And the sun, which had grasped its light, reflected from the eyes of black women and its heat from the love of their men, the sun went skinny and fell wheezing into the sea, warming it to a pallid soup of dead fish and melted pearls. The beast did not adapt to darkness, starved, finding no one else to kill. And Monkey Jr., on his knees, the only man left, prayed. So that's that. A uh, girl that I knew, uh, Brown, Georgia, who was uh, shooting stuff and she, over, she overdosed and died. In reference to that stuff, see, uh, that heroin and them pills, see, those things are things that got brought into the black community by the white man, primarily by the white so-called jazz musician who, when he couldn't get into the session one way or another, usually brought his little goodies, his candy, his cocaine, his heroin, you know, his pills, you know. And it got because he felt that he had to be in a certain state to do what the black musicians were doing more or less naturally. And now you got it to the point where niggas run around talking about when they hear John Coltrane, ooh, he sure must have been loaded to play like that, you know, which is like a great insult to musicians who practice for eight, 10 hours a day, 
you know, scrape and try to make, you know, try to make it just so they can offer somebody something. And all people got to say is that they're offering them some kind of a doped up vision of the world that doesn't have anything to do with any kind of real work, you know. And anybody who knows anything about black musicians or black African musical tradition in general knows that musicians learn from when they're little and they respect the instrument and they respect the craft and the art itself. And there's a whole lot of hours that have gone into almost any solo you hear by any great, great black musician. You know, when you start saying that he's doing that on the basis of some drug, you know, then you're talking the same thing that, uh, that them people are talking about, about instant this, instant coffee, instant instant life, you know, LSD, instant spirituality, instant everything, and ain't nothing instant but death, you know. So that like anything that's about life is like a, a very long drawn out process that means a whole lot of work. This is a short poem about a musician named Pharaoh Sanders. I'm about five minutes, I'm gonna have to get off here so some, so some other artists can come up here, you know. Uh, this is called Pharaoh. There is a forest within the saxophone which calls of song and prayer. Songs like boils of honey burst within the mouth. They are lanced by God's shadow, which is light. And that's for Pharaoh. This is a thing called No New Music. In Mississippi, balloons of hunger blow themselves up in the bellies of children on porches and slat thin houses held up by stilts. The teeth of mad men turn to wood, to wood, and tar paper and holes in the roof. Holy vessel of truth, sail through the night now and save these children. These children whose legs bend bowed under the bone wilting fire of rickets. Black queen, empty as a raped peanut shell, lie down beneath your quilt of roaches and pray for your children. Pray to the stars who spy at night on your poverty, on your husband with his arm across his eyes, his hands smooth with no money, no work, no wear, his eyes tattooed with the red neck and face of the devil himself, his eardrums playing back the tunes of abuse, the beasts blow through their corn cob pipes. No new music. Uh, this is a poem called Chops Are Flying, and it's dedicated to Ben Webster, Lucky Thompson, Kenny Clark, uh, and a whole Nathaniel Meeks, Horace Taft Scott, Black Arthur, a whole bunch of black musicians who's scuffling and struggling. You know, basically this is about the older ones who have been slept on, you know. That is, that they, uh, they can't make it, but Benny Goodman is a millionaire. So it, is it starts with a quote from a record called uh, Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, which is a record that anybody who's not a damn fool should have. That is, this a meeting of two cultural giants, you know, and the music is fantastic. That is, if you're not so corny that the only thing that you're interested in is the newest thing that some fool shoots through the radio that's being paid by the white man anyway to propagate whomsoever he wants you to like, you know. So if you start studying your own music, maybe you'll find out who uh, Louis really is, you know, and he ain't that that grinning coon that you see for 10 minutes on television every three or four months, you know. He done done a whole lot musically, you know. And in fact, uh, a white critic named Martin Williams once wrote an essay about the fact that the, even the trumpet sound in the so-called classical orchestra was changed by what Lewis did to the trumpet in the 1920s, you know. So if you, if you want to know something about music and what you're doing and what you've done, you know, get on your time and try to get somebody here like Tap Scott or Bobby Bradford or John Carter, somebody here to teach you something about black music so that uh, you won't get them usual games run on you and you won't have to wait till somebody like John Coltrane is dead before you start buying his records, you know, and going to see him. So it starts with this quote from the record. Chops are flying everywhere and there's nothing says Lewis but old Duke left in there. Get away, Duke, get away. Get away, they're all gone, way up to what's beautiful. All the older men mellow down lower than new flowers. But flowers are not animal enough to illustrate the beauty of these men who are graceful as summer, as the warm would be aged, were it buried within a body to then glow through it, blood bent backward and bursting, straight up to God, hit him right between the eyes and make him smile. Yes, it is that they speak and what they have to say is 
unreasonable because of what they are. To have been this black as the casted shape of a great spirit under the bars of this mad and savage place, tipped where the only singing many times was the whistling of a buck-eyed body a dangle like a grotesque blossom from some tree. Slaves anyway, but never emasculated is what these men say to me. Though some stumble upstairs under alcohol, half dollar bottles of dark port, or three times that much for some kind of whiskey, buried like kings in pyramids of flop houses. Their deeds rotted from the minds of the people on the street. Or even like beautiful of the half bell boy meets horn Rex, who had in his last days a job on a jive magazine writing about music or asking an untalented critic Dash if he could get a job as a waiter in a club just to be near it. Barrels of bullshit have been the quicksand these men have had to wade through only so they could continue pulled to be beautiful. But no beauty is wanted here, none at all, never, never. But these men standing tall giants maybe will always be this way. Trees whose height we can climb just listening, to sit there, our legs swung over the branches of their deeds, able with no difficulty to see far beyond the smoke, the buildings, and the terror of these cities. Just as Duke has said, when everything else is gone, the music will still be here. So that's for the cats, you know. We can't have too many more Fats Navarros, I hope. You don't let no more of that happen. Bud Powell. This is, uh, I'm gonna read two more poems and get off the stand so the musicians can come up here. Cause I'm gonna read so they can show you what the real thing is. You know, I'm tr trying to do the best I can. <laughs> but uh, this is the thing called Howling Wolf, a blues lesson book. And it's from an experience I had in 1967 in San Francisco when I went to the Fillmore Auditorium and there was this uh, band, I would imagine, called Country Joe and the Fish whatever that is. And they uh, were singing, supposedly, with all this, these lights and, you know, creating an environment, as they say. And uh, so they was up there, you know, shaking their hair, looking like Prince Valiant, you know, raggedy Prince Valiant, you know, and talking about dropping atom bombs on their mamas and what have you, you know. And like, they were really a part of that whole environment and all those colors and lights on the wall, you know, like their music needed that, you know because it needed something that wasn't coming out of their instruments and wasn't coming out of their mouth. And, and, if, they, and if that didn't make it, they turned, up, that, turned the amp way up, you know, so they could get something, you know, electricity. Because it's like, it's a strange thing. White people invent instruments and they don't know how to play them, or they invent them and they only know how to play them one way. And that's the reason, it's one of the reasons you got electronic music now, you know. Because some of the things that John Cage and uh, other people are doing with machines, Pharaoh Sanders and Arthur Blythe and John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins and Ornette Coleman can do with them horns, see? But like, they can hear that in the horn, see? And because, but it, you know, that's a detailed musical explanation of why they can hear it. But uh, the Grays had to give up their instruments and go into electricity, which may be closer to what they are, I don't know. But uh, this is called Howlin' Wolf, a blues lesson book, because Howlin' Wolf came on right after them and he started singing some beautiful blues about loving his old lady, you know? And I think that the blues about that specific relationship of love between that man and that woman is one of the things that has caused us to not become faggoty as much as, as white cats, because I don't think that many times that the popular white art anyway, or the art that has been popularized, allows, you know, a, a specific attitude towards that woman. See, whatever white artists were really existed, like William Butler Yeats, are traded in for people like faggot, faggoty type death wishes like T.S. Eliot because most white critics can get closer to T.S. Eliot than they can to William Butler Yeats because if they got to Yeats, they'd have to have some kind of courage about their life, you know. And I don't think that most Americans are interested in living a courageous life anyhow. But here's Howlin' Wolf. Anyway is the spirit. You can't stop me, I stand up as a man. Flesh, do it, then sloop over there. There's nothing I'm not but God, I can take anything. Stand up, my black eye bloodshot as an old man, an old black man, and you can't stop me. Come here, woman, give me a kiss. Not about Mr. Other Man's mama around the corner, huge, or tinkling a bigness like leaves, her black hair, or whether she sat on the porch and swapped flies from the baby's ass. If she was sad and sucked herself a sore, so what? Get up anyway, you can't stop me. I'm gonna ride through on the blues. From up out of gullies, the lighted strangle hair of electricity and bodies in jagged blonde locks and hysterical gesticulation. A white girl trembling like a rodent to get to the music. I got one for you. I shoot through 
blue light shows. My nostrils raise smells of life outside this ice. My big nose dripping pairs of sweat. I'll bite my lip. I'll shake air upside my head. I'll stomp my foot. Cause I got a woman, must rising up off her like clouds. I got a big old little woman. I can taste her mouth by sucking my cheek. That's what I got now. Fuck with that. I can swiggle up against your titties, see them just as shaking like tear-shaped glitters. A brown air with great nipples swinging against the breeze in the window. Or see them raising spotting shriveled cantaloupe skins. Whatever they become, about to break through the day into death, I'm gonna be with you, baby. So now let me see that big old pussy. Get pretty. Get pretty. You know I'm gonna hang, gonna hang your hair in my head tomorrow. I come here in all my evil and dare you believe I can't love you. But they, they are afraid of blackness. On lying one side up against something cold they can't suffer. Don't know how, ain't heard the howl choked in the dark. Sliding black evil on its belly down in the bushes. But cry electricity against the walls. These people leaping crazy into the air. Trying to hide behind kisses in each other's mouths. Trying to hide, make themselves look like another way. Like colored streams of ice cubes. Light show, green, pink. Like screaming burry rivers, the trees black, limbs like daggers, the terror, the shouting, hopping corduroy terror, so dry their soft mouths, so buck their eyes by fears no squint of being stoned will hide, slimy with the wetness of shivering, they run in rectangular muscles, their hearts slip from the stirrups that would ride them in defiance of darkness, what I'm saying is the white boys... The ones with the band, they tears came out. Yes, they did, in liquid dimes. But step back, Satan, you ain't shit to this nappy head so hard. Don't nothing come through but love. I spit on your electricity. Call me horse. Don't care about sadness. I'll sit by myself anywhere, anyhow. That's how it works. quiet as kept that was supposed to be a love poem if anybody recognized it and I'm gonna read one poem about a, a great man and, and a short one about John Coltrane so this is called Blue Moon the Hog in the Spring a boogie tune Kusiliwa which means bird <laughs> uh the motion would be raised way, way up like Elvin Jones behind John Coltrane. The spiritual, like watching a tree grow up soft but fast, it would be like that. But there is no dancing room in this hole. The pink interior decorators have polished the slime which lines the walls of this hole. This hole is a foxhole. But it is not run by beautiful women, you can believe that. Believe that, Miss Lady, if I were to take you out, I would rather you wear your own eyelashes, rather you polish the dark beauty of your cheeks with but water, rather that I carry you out into the world than a painting by Max Factor and Helena Rubinstein. Only because you are so beautiful just as you are. Only because you are so beautiful just as you are. Beware, brother, that you do not turn a wolf under the blue moon of the white man's eye. A moon dog and assassin turned upon your own people merely because other slaves who speak different languages than you have thrown grenades into this foxhole. This kingdom, which is a glistening toilet, you've been flushed down and crown your own stupidity by convincing yourself you love the water the blue dark water. The water which is the melted eyes of dead white men, which is a mulligan stew of blown up children and shot down saints who ran the snot sputum and rock throwing gauntlet of wilted white songs which turned to swords you let fall and could not even cry when Malcolm, black folk singer and geyser died. Yes, nigga, 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 it was your songs he sang. Too late blues dudes turned around caught the things I used to do or somebody changed the lock on my door or a change is gonna come or all the black who whistle at high school bitches because they're afraid to do anything else besides sit next to the liquor store. It was all the trepidating tears he was talking about. All the trepidating tears we once wished were birds that those black men's bravery would wing against the sky as huge birds with feathers of spears that they would claw the hearts from this encirclement of white animals. Bloodshed is what he sang and hurled them sizzling against the sun. But those tears became bullets and broke through, broke through our beautiful black warrior's chest and his blood like the blood of so many others became the blues and the sticky Venus flytrap blanket beneath which the descendants of the witches of Salem now rest. And now as we stand in the shadows of the blood stains that block the sun, all praise Big Red, the bloodied pearl and rebuilt African wisdom. 
All praise El Hajj Malik El Shabazz forever. Salam Malik Salam. And lastly, this is a thing called After the Rain, which is taken from a song that a very great musician named John Coltrane wrote. John's words were the words bird and the other winged creatures sang, how the darkness could and would someday sink behind the sun, how we, when we grew to ourselves, passed what we were, how we would dance outside, bucking the eyes of all stars and all light, how we would be as gentle as the rebuilt wings of a broken sparrow. How we would lick back the rain and wash ourselves with light. And our eyes would meet his. Our God, our own, our Allah, our Brahman. And we, like all oceans, would know and love each other. Salam. Uh, the, the Black Student Union needs some money, uh, and there are people that have some cans to collect that money that they need to get different people, you know, that are in jail for one reason or another out of them jails. You know, if you leave and, you know, give up some money because we need that money to do different things. But I think another thing before I go in terms of what Black Student Unions have to get to is like, can't nobody be revolutionary, and I ain't talking about no specific. Black Student Union, but ain't a no nigga be revolutionary running around loaded on campus and using revolution as a trick to get some chick to drop her draw. See, we can't get to that. We got to do something better than that. And like real corny type instructors for black studies is not what we need either. If we gonna get anything, you know, for black students because whatever we gonna do later on is what the kids that are gonna be coming up under us are gonna need, you know. Just cause somebody is black, <laughs> you did. If the nigga ain't on his job, you did. Don't let the nigga in, see. And on top of that, like, you know, there are a whole lot of things I think in terms of culture that are hip and cool, but like, I, I may have some African type clothes on, but like a brother that's got a conk or what have you, you know, is not necessarily a maniac, you know. And I think that a whole lot of these so-called black revolutionaries are running around reading these white boys' sociology books like Monaghan and others who don't know what they're talking about and are taking those same premises and trying to project them on black people, you know. And like, we're gonna have to write our own history books and we're gonna have to get people like Ralph Ellison who know what happened, you know, who knows rather what happened in the 30s and in the 40s, you know, to get to write those books, you know, because these white boys are looking at something from a whole different thing, you know, just like uh, that book I was telling you about, about that woman that was writing about those field singers in the 1850s. She was thinking they were making mistakes because they were singing, you know, the flatted thirds, fifths, and sevenths, you know, but they were saying what they heard, see, and she couldn't figure out what they were doing, so she was saying it was a mistake, you know. And so I think that, like, uh, we have to start looking at ourselves our own kind of ways, you know. So here comes the band.